the um, purpose of this presentation is to introduce you to OpenAPI 2.0, also known as Swagger, and how to use it. Um, there are two flavors of OpenAPI. There is 2.0, which is also known as Swagger, and 3.0, which is under active development and fixes many of the problems with the 2.0 specification. So why are we spending our time talking about 2.0? The first reason is that most specifications you will come across implement 2.0. Um, OpenAPI 2 uh, Swagger is over four years old. In this time, a lot of good tooling has developed. Um, 2.0 is the end of the line for the Swagger name, by the way. Um, if you hear the word Swagger, it means 2.0. It was shortly after this that the OpenAPI initiative took off and adopted Swagger as OpenAPI. Um, OpenAPI 3 fixes a number of important deficiencies in 2.0, but tooling is still weak in comparison. Um, the two specifications are not compatible, but I would say that about 90%, maybe 95% of what we'll talk about today does apply to OpenAPI 3. They share the same syntax and nearly all of the features. There's a few differences in how um, uh, uh, documents validate. So given a 2.0 specification, it would take someone experienced maybe an hour or two to make it work for a 3.0 specification, uh, depending on the size of the spec. So going backward from 3 down to 2, you will probably lose some functionality, but it can be done as well. So what problems does OpenAPI solve? Um, in the olden days, when we wanted to validate inputs, this is just an object-oriented example, we would do things like this, right? We would slurp in all of the arguments, and we would inspect the argument uh, hash to make sure that the, what we're looking for is there, and then we would apply some kind of a type constraint on it to validate that. Uh, uh, in, m in the modern world, we can do that in one line, um, but in the context of an HTTP API, how do we validate JSON as it comes in? Um, many APIs are still stuck in the Bronze Age of validation. Um, every controller checking all of its inputs and outputs. Um, at uh, Bluehost, we have the advantage to have um, API base that handles most of this for you, as well as documentation. Uh, this is one of the problems that OpenAPI also solves. Uh, before we get too much deeper into OpenAPI 2 or Swagger, I will remind you that Swagger itself borrowed its JSON validation syntax from JSON schema, which is still an active project. JSON schema was created to give us the ability to describe precisely um, the syntax and structure of a JSON document. Um, JSON schema bends your brain a little bit because it uses JSON syntax to describe the shape of a JSON document. This means that the JSON schema specification is described using JSON schema. Um, to avoid this brain bending effect and because I think YAML is uh, easier to read, I'm going to use YAML in my examples. Um, so, uh, and in fact, when you write a JSON schema or, or a um, Swagger document, either one, you can describe it using JSON or YAML syntax. They're both, they're both fine. So properties that begin with a dollar sign uh, have special meaning. And in this case, the ID property indicates this document's URI, which in REST semantics is its identifier. The schema property um, indicates that this document validates against this given version of JSON schema. In this case, it's draft seven. The rest of the properties describe the schema itself. Um, some of these are self-descriptive, such as title and description, and these can be used by documentation generators, uh, so humans can understand what this property is for and how to use it. Um, other properties, such as type and properties, describe the syntax of the JSON of the document that will be validated. In this case, we are declaring that the document in this schema uh, will validate must be a JSON object, not an array or a string. And further, we described, uh, we described that this object's properties with the properties property. So um, this object must contain at least three keys, um, first name and last name, which are both strings. You can see that in the type declaration there. And age, which, is, uh, which must be a zero uh, or posit which must be zero or a positive integer. Um, so this JSON schema describes this kind of JSON document here. I won't go much into the syntax of JSON schema, but I have some references at the end you can look at if you like. Um, in order to use OpenAPI, either version two or version three, you will need to become familiar with JSON schema. And you will also need to pay attention to which versions of uh, what you're looking at. For example, OpenAPI 2 
uses JSON schema draft four, and OpenAPI three uses JSON schema draft five. So if you're looking at a five spec trying to make it work for your you know, swagger document, you're gonna run into some problems. So here is a brightly color-coded example of an OpenAPI2 specification. I color-coded it just so we can talk about the different parts. Um, most schemas will have a few more parts than this, but this, this is kind of like the minimum viable syntax here. So we start with a swagger property. This tells the parser of what version of OpenAPI we're using. A swagger, or a, an OpenAPI3 document will say, instead of swagger, it will say OpenAPI and then 3.0. So that's how you as a human can immediately tell which uh, which version of the of the uh, documentation you should be looking at. Um, next we have this info property. This is metadata for humans. This is used to generate documentation, um, other things like that. It's for you to look at and, and typically um, they recommend using um, semantic versioning um, for your APIs. Uh, finally, uh, next we have the base path property. Uh, this tells OpenAPI how to build URLs from path endpoints that we're going to discuss in the next section. So this says that uh, you can see we have uh, timers uh, up above, so in it would be a uh, slash API slash v1 slash timers. This gets prepended to all of the routes. Uh, and this disappears in OpenAPI 3, by the way. Um, OpenAPI 3 describes its URLs differently. Here is the paths object. It has zero or more paths, and each path is another object. Um, each path has one or more HTTP methods it supports. So here's the timer path, and it supports two methods, get and post. And each of these has its own um, description. And then finally, we have down here a definitions property, which includes reusable definitions found elsewhere in our document. The um, post declaration, let's look at that a little more closely here. If you look at the bottom of the post declaration on the left, you'll see this $ref thing under schema. Um, this uses JSON pointer syntax to refer to another part of this document, which is the timer resource here in the definitions section. So look closely at that timer resource. Does that look familiar? Um, it's, it is a JSON schema document. So uh, we'll talk about how these two things relate a little bit more closely in a moment. So this schema will validate JSON documents that have at least these three properties, activity, start, and stop. Uh, these types give us some simple validation. The formats here are mainly for documentation purposes, but a set of formats are actually validated. So for example, if you specify a format of date here, like we did under start and stop, or email, for example, um, OpenAPI will apply a type constraint on the string on the incoming JSON document or outgoing JSON document and um, throw an error if the string did not match a known date format or email format. So you get some nice built-in validation using JSON schema. So let's look again at our OpenAPI document to see how these two things relate. Notice again here the schema property of the post. Um, the OpenAPI will be expecting a JSON schema here. This ref, $ref property will be replaced by the contents of the definition it points to, kind of like a pound include in C. We could have, um, like that. We could have written these in line. I could have taken this type object, properties, activity, start, stop, and, and moved it up into the post. And that's what happens under the hood when, when this is parsed. But this allows, um, uh, this creates better documentation by separating these, these things and giving them a name. Um, and it, we, can, we can reason about those objects a little bit more. And it also gives us an opportunity for reuse later. So there are two basic use cases for OpenAPI. Um, one is that you already have some models um, and behavior that you want to expose over an HTTP API. So you need a specification and maybe some controllers. Um, the other use case is that you have a specification given to you and it's your job to implement it. And so you need to supply controllers and, and maybe some models. We're gonna focus mostly on number one here. Uh, if there's afterward, if you have questions, I can show you uh, what number two might look like. So if you remember a few weeks ago, maybe it's been, maybe it's been a few months, I don't even remember now. Um, we, we talked about, uh, we were talking about object orientation <coughs> in Perl and um, we, we, we created a, a, the classes to support a time tracking application. And um, so here we have a fairly primitive activity timer. This is a, this is a, a, a mock UI here. 
uh, you have to supply your own timer, a start time, a stop time, and an activity. But once you've submitted the timer, we, we want to then show um, an updated activity summary. And this, is, this, this UI is what we're going to try to support in our API. So we're going to design an API that will match this, um, will support this application. Um, as I mentioned, we looked at some classes for the time tracking application. When you design a REST API, you're designing it for a specific purpose, for a client in mind, rather than just exposing your data models out to the internet. Uh, this means that your API should be sympathetic to the client's needs. And in order to be sympathetic, you have to have some notion of what the client is trying to do. So whenever I'm working with a development team on API design, the first thing I ask for typically is UX wireframes. Um, this gives me a mental model of what they're trying to accomplish. And, and once in a while, we learn that the platform simply cannot support a particular design. And so we have to work with UX to make sure, uh, make the necessary adjustments. Um, once we have a picture of what the UI is trying to present to the user, uh, then we can design our API to help meet those needs. So we're going to now look at some code. So keep this in mind. This is the application we're going to write an API for. Okay, so uh, some people like to um, edit their Swagger document in an online editor, and we're, I'm going to show you what that looks like here. I've pulled up editor.swagger.io. You can go there yourself, and um, it will have a, uh, I think it's pet store, sample here. I've just pasted in my Swagger document into this. Um, you'll notice immediately um, it gives you, it's a nice editor, it's color uh, syntax, and um, you can download this and run, the, run it locally on your own um, laptop. Um, it, that, it gives you immediate feedback. I can put in a, a, a syntax error here and it would let me know, it lets me know immediately um, if I'm missing something. So let's say I misspelled paths, I had an extra S in there. I get two errors. One is a structural error uh, should not have additional properties, and it tells me, uh, you know, paths double S. And then it also tells me that we're missing a required paths property here, which is nice. It's, it's two errors for one, uh, for one uh, bug. Uh, I fix that, and, and the validation kicks in and says, hey, that, that's much better. Um, so now we have a syntactically correct OpenAPI2 document. And um, one of the advantages of doing this kind of design work before you actually code has a few significant advantages. Um, one, I'm going to, let me show you here, I'm gonna generate a server um, that will serve this um, interface. Um, we have a variety of languages here. These each are at different levels of maturity and quality. Um, I like the Node.js server, so I'm gonna, I just click that and it downloaded here. I'm gonna decompress that and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back over to my terminal, and we're going to go into uh, the Node.js server that just got pulled down, and we're going to npm install. Oops. We're going to install that. So while that's happening, um, once we have a specification, it's easy for the UI to now explore the shape of the API, independent of, there doesn't have to be any backend work done. They can look at examples and then use it to generate their own mock server, which is what I'm demonstrating now. They can say now npm start, a couple more modules to compile, and there we go. It says your server is listening on port 8080, and there's some Swagger UI available here, so I'm going to click that. And you can see that we get, uh, I'll expand this, we get a very beautiful, um, some very beautiful documentation that you can you can actually try it out um, in line here. Uh, it gives you examples. It made a, an example um, payload for me to create a new timer that includes start, stop, and activity. Um, it, it shows me an example of what a response might look like. Um, I'm going to flip over to another tab, and we will do a um, post. So I'm going to uh, post. I'm setting the content type to application JSON, and my payload is going to be a JSON document of the type that we talked about earlier here, it needs to match this here. And um, I'm going to uh, just hit that. Oh, I'm on port 8080. There we go. So when I get a, um, I get an empty response back. I could, um, th there's other things we could do. I could do a, uh, a get now. Um, could do this here, and I think I'm on port 8080. So this is all fake data, but this is definitely enough for a UI to start developing against. Um, and, it's, and it will follow the contract that we've defined in our specification. 
Uh, all of that comes for free as part of the uh, uh, using Open API. Um, let's see, you get beautiful documentation, management loves that. Um, it's also a very nice reference for developers. And I think the most important thing you get when you're working on your API itself um, is you get a uh, empathy for the client. And I can't tell you how many times I've written an API and then realized I had, I'd gotten the design all wrong later when I tried to use it myself. Um, I was thinking more in terms of the models and what, how I might compose those rather than actual use cases of composition. And, and it turns out those are often very different things. And um, so having a nice API to work with that just gets the thing done that you want and, and allowing that composition to happen at, a, at, a, at that middleware layer um, is very nice. So we're done now with part one. We've designed and created our Swagger API. Let me just um, Swagger handle. So this is what it looks like, and you saw that earlier. We've defined um, two paths. We've defined get timers summary that will support um, this portion down here. And then uh, this part up here, it's a form that we post to that accepts a start time and a stop time is, is, is this lower portion here. Uh, timers post and it accepts for its schema a timer object and that is defined down here under definitions timer definitions timer it's an object that at least requires start and activity so these are required fields and then we have some properties uh, that describes those fields integers and then a string So um, for the sake of time, I'm going to copy and paste um, a bunch of stuff. We're going to now integrate our Swagger document into a Mojalicious application. And so in order to do that, I'm going to copy um, some code from a previous um, uh, go around. This code is available on GitHub. So I, what I've just pulled in was the, the application start script. Um, I've also pulled in the main application class, which is called time colon colon tracker, and also a controller uh, called timers. And we'll look at each of those in just a moment. I'm also going to pull in a, a test. F oh, one thing I haven't done yet is um, prove. I wanted to, you know, sh here's our, our application, our, our low level object classes, and, and, they're, and they're working and tested. Um, I'm going to pull in another test file for our Mojalicious application. I'm going to pull in a configuration file. And then, um, oh, I think that's it. I think we already got the script, right? OK, we did. So we're going to look at these now. The entry point for Mojalicious apps um, is the script file. There's nothing user serviceable in there. Um, so we're just going to, it's what you get when you say Mojo generate app. Uh, we're going to look at now the, the time tracker class. This is what Modulicious loads when it first gets started. This is the time tracker class. The first thing we do, I'm going to load the tracker object because we're going to, uh, tracker class because we're going to need that. Um, the first thing we, that happens here, Modulicious will look for a method called startup and it will um, run it. And that is how we initialize our Modulicious application. Once that has finished, control passes back to the event loop and Modulicious will now be listening as an HTTP server for incoming requests. So here we have, uh, we're going to load the configuration plugin. The, um, let me show you what our configuration file looks like. It's, it's very simple. It just has a couple of lines. It has, um, we'll look at those now. So here we have a, the, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to um, invoke load class, which comes from class load. It's basically doing an eval require. Um, it's, what is it loading? It's loading this ledger class from our configuration file, which is ledger file here. Um, and then we're going to pull in some args, perhaps, if there are any. And in this case, we do have some. We have ledger file is pointing to a, a, a text file. Mm -hmm. If I go out to my, um, I have, uh, you can see that it, it, it's an empty file here. But that's, that's where we're going to be storing our time tracking events. The, uh, the next thing we do is we create a new helper called tracker. This uh, is essentially creating a dynamic method that gets added to every controller that every controller can now access and run. And what it will return it is this is kind of the singleton pattern. If you're into design patterns, we're creating a new tracker class. If it uh, doesn't already exist, if it exists, if it does exist, we're just going to return that. We're passing into that 
our new ledger. So this tells, this allows us to, um, maybe we want an in-memory ledger for, for unit tests. Maybe we want a simple file system based ledger for, for local development. Maybe we want a, a, a cloud ledger for you know, our production deployment or MySQL or something. The last thing we do is we load the open API plugin. This is where all of the magic happens. It takes an argument here as a hash reference. Um, we just tell it where, what Swagger file to load. Now, one of the things, let me pull open that, um, let me pull open that Swagger file here. It goes through the Swagger file and it looks for every path in the path. So it's going to create a, a, a get timers summary handler and it's going to create a post timers handler. Now when those two, when somebody makes a request for get timer summary, open API, the open API plugin needs to know what to do. Well, we tell it to right here with this xmojo2. We're saying, oh, whenever we get a request for get timer summary, I want you to go open the timers controller and invoke its summary method. So let's look at that, or, and, and for timers append for the other one. So they're both in the timers controller. Let's load the, um, the timers controller here. Let me open this up here. It's not very big. Uh, the reason that's not very big is because nearly all of the hard, all of the tedious stuff is happening in the Open API plugin. So remember, we had two paths. We had get um, a timer summary, and that will load this controller here. Uh, what happens is the um, the input will be validated using the Open API plugin. If there is a failure, like if something doesn't work, we're going to return because it already threw an error for us, a 400 error. Otherwise, we're going to invoke, here's that uh, helper that we created, the tracker helper. We're going to invoke the tracker's summary method, which returns a hash reference of uh, you know, uh, how much time we spent in each activity. If we have failed to meet our contract for the user as defined in the specification, let me load that specification again. This says in our response, we're going to return um, an, uh, an object that has uh, timers. Let me see if I can pull this side by side here. That's not as, that's okay right there, right? Yeah. Um, uh, oh, that's summary. Yeah, it, it, it needs to be an array of timers. And that timer is defined uh, down, whoops, I'm in the wrong window, down here again. So that's what we would be expecting to see in our, in our uh, response. And then for the append, when we want to append a new timer, we also validate the input. Now, summary doesn't have any input. There are no query strings. We, have, we, just didn't, we don't have any. We only have a response defined here. But if we go down to where we create a new timer, we do have some parameters here, and it takes there in the body. And what is it? It's going to be this schema here, this definitions timer, which again, we've defined right here. It's, it's gonna be a timer object in, in JavaScript. Uh, notation. So we're going to validate that input, make sure it's an actual timer looking kind of thing. We're going to pick out the, that, now we called it timer uh, because that's what it's called here, but it's, it's just the JSON object. We're going to create a new timer from that. This is a hash reference. And then we're going to append that timer using the trackers append event. And then we're going to simply say, hey, we did it. Good job. Uh, thank you for your, thank you for your timer. Let's see if I can open that. And so that is, that's it. The, this class here, the, the controller, and the, um, and the, uh, the startup is, is all we need, along with most of the work is done in the, in the Swagger document. Um, I can now uh, script, I can now run this. So it's listening on port 3000. We'll go back over here. We'll do a, um, we'll go to, uh, 3,000, we'll, we'll uh, retrieve the current uh, timers. There are none. Uh, so let's uh, post, let's create a new one, 3,000. I'm going to add a new presentation activity. It uh, should be 500 seconds because we take the stop time minus the start time. And we can see that we got a 201 created event uh, response and it says, thank you, timer created. Now, if we, we check the timer summary, we should see, yes, here is summary. We had a presentation and it was 500 seconds. I'm gonna remove this, oops, remove this include so that I can uh, JSON PT this here. 
There, summary presentation. I can, um, let's, let's, let, let's look at how the validation works. Um, I'm gonna just misspell activity. And we get uh, an error back from open API, a 400 response, which is typical of bad request. And it says errors, message, missing property, path, timer, activity. So we're missing, we're missing a, a, the timer slash activity property, which is under, it, it, it's this right here. So we can fix that. Let me remove this. We don't need to see the headers anymore. We'll remove that and we'll put a working timer created. And now when we do our um, output, we can see that we now have two, uh, you know, two, two uh, activities, uh, summaries, working and presentation that we've done. So that was all it, that's, that's all it takes to create a, um, a JSON schema specification is design work. That's the hardest work. And that didn't, that didn't, I didn't have time in a half an hour to show you because it takes, it takes hours to get that right. But once you've got that right, now your, your, um, your UI and your backend development can proceed independent of each other because you have this contract that's right between the two of you. And this document should be versioned, uh, put into version control, uh, given that that 1.0.0 using semantic versioning, uh, if you make a patch level change, you increment the last number. If you make a, a minor version, which means added functionality, you can change that middle number. But if you make a breaking change, you change the first number. And as long as you keep um, uh, you know keep that contract, um, you can your your development can proceed independently. Uh, you get some lovely documentation and things like that. Uh, let me make sure I haven't missed anything. I think that's it. So we have our server working now. Uh, we can now start to integrate with UI work. Now they've, they've already developed their, their UI against a mock server that we were able to give them because we gave them a Swagger document. And we've been building against their models. Yes, they've been building against their models that we have, that we've exposed and defined in our, in our document. Um, and, and so this reduces the likelihood of an impedance mismatch uh, that happened when you just have kind of handshake agreements between, you know, between front end and back end. Um, the Mojalicious Open API plugin is uh, just fantastic, and you get so much benefit for so little work. Um, I think that is all I have. We have two minutes. Happy to have questions. Uh, have a comment. Thank you. Thanks, Will. I know that was very quick. That's why we record yeah, this. So you can go back to nice this. The thing about you can you can change, you can increment your your versioning um, of the schema. Yes. And that lets you so you can have clients that are um, that are basically paired with the, the schema version, and they can continue to work. Exactly. I can. I so both. Of the, I might if, if I ever go to a a, a, a 2.0. I keep the 1.0 around because it's still serviceable. And until I can guarantee that all the clients have disappeared, I need to, I need to keep my promise that this was my API. Uh, when Ryan Schuft was out here a few months ago, we talked about you know, we want to start doing stronger contracts for the, from the back end. And this is one way to accomplish that. Um, here's the source code link for this presentation. This will be, of course, in, in Doran's recording. And the slides also are here. And then here are some references. JSON schema version four is what you'll most likely want to become familiar with um, because that's what's used by Swagger uh, slash OpenAPI2. And then the module just plug in OpenAPI. Its documentation is a little weak, but it, it's, um, there doesn't need to be much there. It, it really is kind of self-governing self with one, one argument. Just tell me the name of the Swagger file. And again, it will accept, it will also accept Swagger three or OpenAPI3 or two, depending on what your project and team want to, you know, want to code against. Um, so it's 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 very nice, and I think that's it. We're at time. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs>